morning and welcome to Mountain View United Church's online worship service for Sunday, January 31st, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. I pray that wherever you are worshiping and whenever, you will feel the Holy Spirit moving in you and among you and around you. Come, let us worship. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Praise God who loves us all. Praise God who loves us well. Praise God who invites us to love. Amen.
Let us come together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, love through us as we worship your holy name. Love through us as we listen for your holy word. Love through us as we live your teachings and offer your love to the world. In your majestic name we pray. Amen. God's Story, The Prophets So part of God's story is about the prophets, and it goes like this. Prophets are people who hear from God and share it. We sometimes think of prophets as people who know the future, but really, they know whatever God tells them, which could be anything, because God knows everything. Anyway, nowadays, God speaks to all of us. But before Jesus came and before there was the Bible, God spoke to his family through just a few people. Some of those people were prophets. 16 of God's prophets have books in the Bible named after them. And today, we are talking about them. It starts with Isaiah and ends with Malachi. These guys are a pretty big part of the Old Testament, so let's check out what God said to his family through them. This won't take long because even though they lived in different places and hundreds of years apart, they had basically the same message because people have always had the same problem. We disobey God. So the prophets told God's family, you've sinned, now you're in trouble. Of course, the prophets didn't just say this. They got God's family's attention by doing crazy things to show how bad life can get when we're far from God. Like Isaiah, who walked around in his underwear for three years to show what it looks like to lose everything. Or Jeremiah, who hid his belt under a rock until it rotted, then dug it up again so God's family could see what it looks like to be completely destroyed. Seriously, kids, that's in the Bible. And actually, it gets even crazier. Check it out for yourself. See, God is holy, which means he's perfect. He created us to be like him and follow him, but instead, we choose to disobey him, which is sin. Sin has to be punished because if God is perfect, he can't pretend it doesn't matter when we hurt each other or ourselves or his creatures or the earth. The thing is though, God loves us anyway. He doesn't want his family to be in trouble. So he sent good news through the prophets too. They said, if you stop sinning and follow God instead, he'll have mercy on you. Mercy means not getting punished, even though you deserve it. Problem is, nobody could stop sinning for very long. Well, God had a plan for that too. He told some of the prophets, like Isaiah and Zechariah, that one day he would send someone perfect to earth. Someone who could take the punishment for everybody else's sin. And if our sin was paid for, that would mean we weren't in trouble anymore, which means we could come close to God. If 16 different prophets over hundreds of years all said pretty much the same thing, it must be important, right? Even now, for us. After all, we've sinned too, and we need a rescuer. And since the rescuer already came, we can follow God and choose to accept that Jesus took our punishment which means it doesn't separate us from God anymore. And we can talk to God, but also hear from him, which means we can prophesy too. And that's the story of the prophets. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Prophets hear from God and share it. God told a whole bunch of them the same thing. Sin separates people from God. Stop sinning and obey. But God's family couldn't stop sinning. So God promised a rescuer. Hundreds of years later, the rescuer came. And now we can be close to God. We can hear from him and we can share it. And that's a part of God's story. Let us come together in a spirit of contrition as we bring to God our confession. Let us pray. When we cry out with words that hurt, Silence our cries and speak gently through our words. When we act in ways that hurt, even when help is intended, transform our hurtful actions with your grace. When we forget that we are loved and called to love, 
love us back into your likeness that your love might flow freely through us and bring your love to the world. In your holy presence of love, we pray. Amen. Full of mercy and compassion, God knows us to the core of our being and loves us through all of our days. Amen. Scripture comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold account accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Amen. Our Gospel reading comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. 
They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today is the end of January 2021. I wonder if it has been all you had hoped for. In the US, they had a violent insurrection, a muted inauguration, and a second impeachment. Here in Canada, we've had serious interruptions in the supply of vaccines for COVID-19. A second wave of the virus, worse than the first, which has resulted in thousands of deaths and tens of thousands of cases of infected people. And to cap it all off, the Governor General resigned in the midst of a scandal over a toxic work environment at Government House. David Lose wrote, wrote that if 2021 were a product that he'd recently purchased, he'd be inclined to send it back after the 30-day free trial. In our lectionary readings, we are still in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. Jesus has called four of his disciples. Simon, later known as Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And now he moves on to Capernaum and begins his ministry by preaching in the synagogue and casting out an evil spirit. In each of the Gospels, the first things tend to set the tone for much of, of what is to come. Interpreters have noted that the first scenes of each of the Gospels offer a preview of that evangelist's insight into Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus climbs a mountain to teach and interpret the law like Moses. In Luke, Jesus announces that the Lord has sent him to proclaim good news, release, and healing, a message that exemplifies his ministry, even as it is met with rejection. And in John, the first thing that Jesus does is multiply the wine and blessing at Cana, living into the grace upon grace promised in the prologue. So what does this first thing tell us about Jesus according to Mark's story? We see in our reading this morning that he has come to oppose the forces of evil, defined not generically, but rather as anything and everything that robs God's children of life. What are these unclean spirits that Jesus casts out in this passage from Mark today? Is it demon possession? Is it a first century description of mental illness? It's very difficult to know how to interpret unclean spirits in our 21st century. 
The language of unclean spirit is foreign to us. Or is it? What might be the unclean spirits of our age? Could it be a socially media-driven obsession with their own ideas, thoughts, and appearance? Or the disavowal, or at least devaluing, of truth amid a cacophony of conspiracy theories as dangerous as they are ridiculous? Perhaps it's the increased devotion to the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I that measures all things in terms of how it affects me and only me, rather than the broader community. Yes, we may not be comfortable with the notion of an unclean spirit, and yet they abound. And it's just this, all of this, that Jesus' authoritative proclamation of God's coming kingdom opposes. Given all of this, is it any wonder that January of 2021 doesn't seem that different from December of 2020 or January of 1921 or of 1821? Yes, this has been a particularly difficult time, but the forces of selfishness and fear and violence have always been among us. So what happened? If Jesus came to cast out unclean spirits and if people received his authoritative teaching and life-giving actions with amazement, for that is what we heard in the reading from Mark this morning, then why is the world still the way that it is? Now that's a question that the earliest Christians asked as well. It's part of the reason why, in fact, we have the Gospels. As the earliest Christians realized that their expectations about Christ's return were off, they retold the stories of Jesus with an eye to equipping his disciples for the long haul. For this reason, Mark's story, likely the earliest, ends not with an appearance of Jesus, but rather by reiterating Jesus' promise that he has gone ahead to the disciples and they are to follow him. Sometimes called a realized eschatology, such a theology invites the church not to place their hopes in a distance revelation, but to recognize that in his death and resurrection, Jesus inaugurated God's kingdom, opened up a future of possibility and hope, and equips his disciples to live into that kingdom now, even while they wait for its full consummation at the end of time. All of which brings me to ask myself, and hopefully you will ask yourselves as well, what exactly am I doing to continue Jesus' work a month into a new year? Systemic racism, polarized worldviews that tend to demonize each other, environmental disregard and degradation, the list goes on and on. I likely can't, I know, make any monumental contribution to solving these challenges and likely neither can you. But this first act of Jesus doesn't change the world either, except for the world, of course, of the man previously dominated by the unclean spirit. Just one man helped, one life changed. Yet it is in this single act of resistance and healing that Mark chooses to highlight at the outset of Jesus' ministry. A single act, a single life changed for the better. And perhaps that's where we start. Just think of it. 
If even a fraction of the people who hear Mark's invitation to be a disciple of Jesus by following his first and lasting example, the world will not only reflect God's love and reflect it more fully, but those watching may still be amazed and more than that, be inspired. I pray that you may feel inspired yourselves to make a difference in one person's life today. Amen. Let us pray. Holy, awesome God, we bring gifts of paper and coin, symbols of our gratitude and our love. Bless these symbols that they may become acts of love and grace. Bless us and our gifts that we may transform the world with love and grace. In gratitude and hope we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
This week, I ask you to continue to pray for Amy Stackhouse, for Audrey Gauguin, for Janice Gallagher, for Winston West as he prepares to move to Fredericton to be with his daughter, for Jim Moore, who's still grieving the loss of Donna, for Doug Davis, who's still grieving the loss of Judy. And for all who grieve, let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Relationships weave us into your heart, O God. They weave us one to the other. We give thanks for the ways we are woven into your tapestry of knowing our neighbors, of caring, drinking in the glory of your wondrous creation, seeing the intricacy of your weaving, the beauty of life. We now give you thanks in the silence of our heart. We thank you, God, for the opportunities to care, to share lament without trying to fix things, to sit with friends in the midst of death, in the midst of job loss or financial hardship, in the midst of feelings of depression or loneliness or uselessness, in the midst of relations shattered through crime, through separation or divorce, through mental illness, through physical disability, and through death. Thank you, O oh God, for your overwhelming, unconditional, ever-present love, which shapes and nurtures and heals us. Bless us, we pray, in the name of the one who walks with us in the resurrection hope. We offer all of these prayers and the prayers of our hearts 
in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we leave this sacred space, wherever you are, go now to love as beloved children of God. Go now to live as living signs of Christ's presence. Go now to transform the world with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.